It's Friday, July 8th, and this is now on HNN. Developing news, former Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe has died after being shot during a campaign speech. What we're witnessing wasn't a constitutional judgment. It was an exercise in raw political power. President Biden signs an executive order to protect access to abortion. I'm Deborah Alferone at the White House with details of the order, plus the president's plea to Congress. Who's leading the Republican race for governor? We'll show you what our new poll revealed. I have never seen it so crowded. So many people vying to be governor as a Republican. Stores have too much stuff. It's just racks on racks on racks of clearance. Get ready for more discounts. We'll tell you where, coming up on This Is Now. We're following developing news right here in the H&N Digital Center. Former Japanese leader Shinzo Abe has passed away after being shot at a campaign speech. That's right. The suspect is a 41-year-old unemployed man, and police say he fired a homemade weapon. He's in police custody being investigated for murder. We are going now to Kaori and Joji, who's reporting from Tokyo. Japan is in shock today as the former Prime Minister Shinzo Abe was gunned down and killed in broad daylight. The former Prime Minister was stumping, giving a speech for a candidate in the upcoming elections, which are scheduled on Sunday, when he was shot twice, according to police officials and the doctors who treated him. He was airlifted to a nearby hospital in Nara, in the western part of Japan, and despite hours of trying to resuscitate him through blood transfusions, he passed away. Shinzo Abe was Japan's longest serving prime minister, serving twice, most recently until about two years ago. Uh, he was a very influential and towering figure, not only in Japan, but outside the country as well. Gun violence uh, is extremely rare in Japan. Violence alone is very rare. The, the country prides itself on being one of the safest countries in the world. So the nation really is in disbelief, and I fear it will wake up. We'll be waking up to a new reality. For NBC, I'm Kaori and Joji in Tokyo. And this to show you new at noon. After analyzing social media images, CNN reconstructed the scene of Shinzo Abe's assassination. Now, this is where Abe was speaking at a campaign rally near a train station in Nara when he collapsed on the street. Abe was standing inside the pedestrian island and the gunman approached him from behind, firing two shots. He was shot in the neck and chest with the bullets deep enough to reach his heart, doctors say. And we have this new video into our newsroom of President Biden signing a condolence book at the Japanese embassy in Washington, D.C. He made some comments earlier in the day. Here's what he had to say. Japan is a very, very stable ally. And uh, we, uh, I, I do not believe it's likely to have, but I don't know yet, likely to have any profound destabilizing impact on Japanese security or Japanese uh, solidarity. Now, you may recall the former prime minister made a historic visit to Hawaii. The year was 2016, and Abe went to Pearl Harbor to mark the 75th anniversary of the attacks there. He made comments through a translator. Ours is an alliance of hope that will lead us to the future. What has bonded us together is the power of reconciliation. Abe was the first sitting Japanese leader to visit the memorial itself above the battleship that became a tomb for hundreds who died inside during the Pearl Harbor bombing. We should note Abe did not apologize for the attack on Pearl Harbor during his visit, but said in a statement ahead of his remarks that the visit would be an opportunity to soothe the souls of the victims. As well as to the spirits of all the brave men and women whose lives were taken by a war that commenced in this very place. Abe's visit in 2016 came just months after then-President Barack Obama traveled to Hiroshima to pay his respects to the thousands who died there in World War II. And you can see here the leaders participated in a wreath-laying ceremony aboard the USS Arizona Memorial. 
the fruits of peace always outweigh the plunder of war. U.S. Senator Maisie Hirono issued a statement on Abe's assassination. She said in part that she is shocked and deeply saddened by his death. She called Abe a friend to the United States who strengthened the relationship between America and Japan. Hirono, who was born in Japan, has met with the former prime minister several times. From Presidents Bush to Obama to Trump, Abe stood out among the ranks of world leaders in navigating and pivoting between the very different personalities and politics of three American presidents. Former President George W. Bush, who worked with Abe during his first stint as Japanese Prime Minister in 2006, sends his condolences, saying, I am deeply saddened to learn of this senseless assassination. Former President Barack Obama recounted the close relationship the two leaders forged during his second term in office and the extraordinary alliance between the two nations. And former President Donald Trump posted online that Abe is a true friend and a great leader and that he is praying for his family. The death of Abe marks an end of an era in Japanese and Asian politics. Will Ripley takes a look back at his life and legacy. Japan's longest serving prime minister, Shinzo Abe, had big dreams of a Japanese comeback, a comeback marred by a series of setbacks. Tokyo. Yeah! The Tokyo 2020 Olympics, Abe's greatest achievement. Japan spent billions only to see the games postponed by the coronavirus pandemic. The games were a cornerstone of Abe's plan to revive a struggling economy and transform Japan into a global destination. Abe promised a brighter future, a future looking bleak after 2011's massive earthquake, tsunami, and Fukushima nuclear meltdown. Abenomics was an ambitious plan to overhaul Japan's economy with stimulus and reform. It led to record high government debt and failed to make a lasting dent in decades of deflation. Problems made worse by Japan's aging population and shrinking workforce. Abe also tried to strengthen Japan's military, reinterpreting the nation's pacifist constitution drafted after World War II. The move led to massive protests in the Japanese capital. Abe's visits to a controversial war shrine angered his Asian neighbors. He was criticized for not making a new apology at the 70th anniversary of World War II, accused of trying to rewrite Japan's brutal wartime past. Abe began fighting for more military power during his first time as prime minister in 2006. At 52, he became Japan's youngest post-war leader. Corruption scandals within his party caused Abe's popularity to plummet. He resigned a year later, blaming health problems. Abe had ambition and roots in a powerful political dynasty, two former prime ministers in his family. Re-elected in 2012, Abe declared, Japan is back. He tried to raise Japan's profile on a global stage, developing allies in Europe, India, and Southeast Asia, trying to mend frosty relations with China. Abe was one of the first world leaders to form an alliance with Donald Trump, taking the U.S. president out for a hamburger in Tokyo. Shinzo Abe leaves behind Akie, known as a vibrant and popular first lady and his wife of more than three decades. Again, gun violence is extremely rare in Japan. Last year, Japanese police reported only 10 shootings, not including accidents or suicides. Of the 10 shootings, only one person was killed. As we mentioned at the top of the show, in order to buy a gun in Japan, there's a 12-step process that is both time-consuming and expensive. It includes taking a gun safety class, passing a written test, getting a doctor's note saying you're mentally fit, and allowing police to inspect your gun storage. This just into our newsroom, new at noon, the FBI director doing an interview with CNN. He's talking about violence and politics. I want to play out a portion of that interview. There are way, way too many people uh, in today's world who uh, are taking their... Uh, very passionately held views and manifesting them through violence. Uh, and in our system, as you know, uh, under the First Amendment, uh, it doesn't matter what you're upset about, 
who you're upset with or what side of an issue you're on, there's a right way under our Bill of Rights to express yourself. And violence, threats of violence, destruction of property, uh, those kinds of things are not it. And you can see here in this new video, a flag is at half staff at the Japanese embassy in Washington, D.C. and in Taiwan. The famous Taipei 101 building is lit up in honor of former Prime Minister Abe. We're going to continue to follow this still developing story here at Hawaii News Now. Look for the latest coming up on First at 4 on KHNL and keep checking your HNN digital platforms for updates. We want to take a deeper dive into our new HNN Civil Beat poll. On the GOP side in the race for governor, despite a last minute entry, former Lieutenant Governor Duke Iona has 27%, with MMA champion BJ Penn at 24%. In third is City Council member Heidi Sunyoshi at 9%, with about 29% of Republican voters still unsure. Civil Beat Politics and Opinion Editor Chad Blair says if Penn wins the nomination, his criminal record will be questioned. As you know, there is a uh, not a short list of incidences that he's been involved in that are legally of concern. So I think uh, Duke Iona recognizes that as well, and probably he, he had determined that all he has to do is get 35, 40% of the vote or less uh, in order to win this nomination. Following the front runners are Aloha Freedom Coalition leader Gary Corderi at 7% and Lynn Mariano and Paul Morgan both at 3%. I have never seen it so crowded, so many people vying to be a governor as a Republican. Looking at the demographic breakdown, Iona tends to appeal to older and conservative voters, while Penn supporters tend to be more younger and moderate. Look for more information about our poll at hawaiinewsnow.com. President Biden is announcing a new response to that Supreme Court ruling to overturn Roe v. Wade, a decision that legalized abortion 50 years ago. This comes amid growing push from his own party to act. Deborah Alfaron has more. President Biden signed an executive order Friday as he sharply criticized last month's Supreme Court ruling that overturned 1973's Roe v. Wade decision that legalized abortion. What we're witnessing wasn't a constitutional judgment. It was an exercise in raw political power. The president directed Health and Human Services to protect access to abortion medication and to ensure emergency medical care for pregnant women and those experiencing pregnancy loss. The order also directs agencies to educate medical providers and insurers about how and when they're required to share privileged patient information with authorities. Abortion rights advocates fear that information could be used to prosecute women who have the procedure. And the president is asking the Federal Trade Commission to take steps to protect the privacy of those seeking reproductive care online. The president signed the order amid growing criticism from fellow Democrats that he wasn't responding forcefully enough. But the president said that his ability to protect abortion access is limited without congressional action. The fastest way to restore Roe Ro, is to pass a national law codifying Roe. Go out and vote. Well, for God's sake, there's an election November. Vote, 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 vote. Since the court's ruling, at least 10 states have enacted a near total ban on abortion. Within months, the procedure could be illegal or severely restricted in nearly two dozen states. Deborah Alfaron, CBS News, the White House. Of course, we have more on that story on your h and digital platform. So we want to switch gears now and take you live somewhere really cool Taking you live to Fremont Street oh, yes. there in Sin City, right there. Guess what? It is 106 <laughs> degrees there in Las Vegas. I don't see too many people crowd in Fremont Street right now. Well, that's when you stay in the casinos all day and yeah, night. Yeah, hit up that pool. Mm -hmm. Rent a cabana. Have some fun. <laughs> yeah, maybe have some luck. But we're having some luck here because it's only 80 degrees here. So compared to their 106, okay. I'll... Take it. Yes. And it, right before we took it live, there was a giant Bud Light truck that went by. <laughs> That's another way you can keep cool. All right, guys, let's get an <laughs> update on all those weather conditions the islands are facing. Here's Billy V.
Let's take a look at the weather for today. Easterly winds 15 to 20 miles per hour, partly cloudy skies, passing showers, daytime high going to be near 87. It may feel warmer that in some areas. Saturday and Sunday, you take that weather and you can practically copy paste that all the way through till Tuesday. Wednesday, things start to change a little bit. By Thursday, we may start to feel some of the effects from Hurricane Bonnie. It will get weaker as it gets into cooler waters to a tropical storm, a, uh, a also a uh, remnant low. But we're expecting that some of that rain may caught up in the trade wind flow and perhaps enhance our shower activity over the islands. That's best seen scenario. We need the help with the drought. So we will be tracking it for you here on your severe weather station. Well, one of the reasons inflation surged so much this year is because some stores didn't have enough goods to sell because of the shipping delays. Well, now all of a sudden the products have arrived and stores have a surplus and they're selling those products at a discount. Carter Evans explains. It's just racks on racks on racks of clearance. It's a big surprise for shoppers burdened by rising prices. Is this really 664 was 21? Deep discounts across the country. It's a retail Armageddon. And retail consultant Bert Flickinger says that's good news for shoppers. Biggest discounts, uh, consumer electronics, sporting goods on apparel, uh, clothes, accessories. It's cargo that was stuck in a traffic jam at sea during the pandemic. Well, now those ships have come in at a time when inflation is forcing consumers to cut back. Too many goods and too many stores chasing too few shoppers with too few dollars. He estimates some stores are overstocked by more than 30 percent, and there's just no place to put everything. Target recently admitted it needs to right-size its inventory, and the retailer's plans include additional markdowns. We bought 25,000 of these uh, Adirondack chairs from a national chain. The extra goods often end up with liquidators like Bargain Hunt, which discounts up to 70%. But this year, merchandising VP Norm Rankin is seeing something different. The condition of the product, it's never left the case. It didn't make it to the stores. It's not dog-eared or wrinkled or ruffled having been on a shelf. And goods from last year are still coming. We have been in negotiation with some large retailers on Christmas goods, almost $30 million worth of new Christmas product that didn't make it in time. When do you think we'll start seeing the deepest discounts? Deepest discounts will be between Labor Day and Columbus Day, uh, and then uh, very big discounts right after Halloween. And when it comes to returns, especially larger items, the stores can't take it. Is that a hint for consumers here? If you take something back, you're likely going to get the money back and get to keep it? I uh, very good chance. Carter Evans, CBS News, Los Angeles. That whole keep the re uh, return and keep it yeah. idea, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah, I need furniture. They need furniture to go on sale. Yeah, well, I heard like Wayfair and stuff was discounting, but the shipping to here is almost impossible yeah. if they even offer it. Right. So good luck with that. Yeah, yeah. thanks. <laughs> yeah, but it looks like the time to remember is right after Halloween. Yeah. So that's when we should do our Christmas shopping, my friends. Perfect timing. Yep. All right, let's see what else the internet is buzzing about. This band, you know who they are, guys. Oh, yes. You know who they are. Journey, they're out with the new album for the first time in 11 years. It's called Freedom, and it was created during the pandemic. Like so many people got really busy with their music mm -hmm. in the pandemic. The band says it brings back a grand to a grand scale the group's greatest moments along with an updated sound. Freedom is available today. Question, will it be as big as a karaoke hit as their other you know, past hits. We'll see. Yeah. Your favorite Journey song, John? Oh, don't <laughs> stop believe. Yeah, that's, that's a good one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You? Uh, that one, Open Arms, Faithfully. You know a lot more than me. When the lights go down in the city. Oh, so many. that's so good. So many. That's so good. That's yeah. so good. Well, Barbie, the signature collection, has released a limited edition doll of, get this, it's inspired by music legend David Bowie. So the Barbie replicates the powder blue suit worn by Bowie in the Life on Mars promotional film, as well as his signature blue eyeshadow and 70s glam hairstyle. And the background's like super psychedelic yeah. mod too, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah, all well, sorts of Barbies. Oh yeah, they come out with everything. If you need something for your kids to do this summer, McDonald's is giving children the chance to go to summer camp without leaving their home. So this is how it works. The fast food giant has opened the virtual doors to Camp McDonald's this week. 
The company says for 27 days in July, anyone can experience its camp. So all you have to do is download the McDonald's app and campers get access to food deals, menu hacks, and limited edition merchandise. They can also attend music performances with different artists once a week. Although the camp has no physical location, it is only open to those with the app in the U.S. Did you ever go to summer camp? I don't think so. I, I mean, I... I not like the long overnight one no i had an awesome one it was called camp on the song it was so cool it was exactly what you'd want in a summer uh -huh. camp water slides and just all sorts of arts and crafts and things like that is in the middle of illinois Fun. very very cool yeah camp. all right guys let's keep talking about things to keep your kids busy with over the summer and there's a one group of kids that are getting really into robotics casey lund lund is alongside them Well, here at Mililani Middle School and really across the state, those big robotics competitions, they've essentially been put on hold because of the pandemic. But Hawaii First Robotics is working to change that and get them back to action. Their mission is to support STEM education and kids as young as six years old, these middle school teams that are doing Lego League robotics, and of course our high schoolers that are doing much more advanced robotics. And this isn't just a hobby or a simple competition. For a lot of these students, real scholarship money is on the line. And I was lucky enough to get a few scholarships at these schools, so it made um, made college for us a lot easier. So I would really recommend that you know these students stay in robotics and you know keep thriving. And as long as you're having fun and you can show that, then it, you might have a chance of twenty-five thousand dollars. Hawaii First Robotics is hosting an expo on July twenty-third to get teams back up and running. It's also an opportunity for new teams to get their start. And we're going to be having huge financial incentives for new teams and for teams that are are going to be mentoring other teams. So we've got not only for the new people, but incentive packages so that veteran teams can go, like the assets team here, they can go and start up and help mentor new teams that are coming in, provide that guidance. And that's one of the things that's really great about the Hawaii First Robotics. Mentoring is a huge part of Hawaii's robotics community. It's really interesting, honestly, because we get to actually teach the younger kids more about it, and we actually get to see how they interact with everything. Building robots and relationships. Um, well, it's really fun, and like you meet new people, so it's kind of nice. And the research aspect is kind of nice, because I like researching things. Again, the details on that expo coming up this July 23rd at 1 p.m. at Kalani High School. For all the details, you can head to hawaiinewsnow.com. Reporting at Mililani Middle School, I'm Casey Lund. For now, we'll send things back to you. That's such a cute, inspiring skill. Oh, yeah. Those are some cool robots. Didn't have anything like that at my summer camp. Same. No. Mm -mm. Well, one more story, you guys. After two years off, get ready to grab some friends and catch the Red Bull party wave. So the team Ooh. surfing competition will kick off again. The Duke's Ocean Fest in Waikiki. Groups must create their own vessels to ride a wave all together. And check out Jamie O'Brien's team back in what? 2019. So they wiped out in their coconut thatched hut <laughs> on an 800 pound surfboard. Oh. Dressing up and performing oh. skits, of course, earned them extra points. So up to 20 teams will be selected at competition August 20th. For a link to register, just head to hawaiinewsnow.com. We have to have a Hawaii News.